Now, uh, let's the, uh, resume our conference. Uh, we'll get back to the conference, and uh, it, it, is, it is time for the uh, keynote speech one. Uh, let me introduce the uh, Professor Kim Gyeong Dong. Actually, his uh, short bio is on page 469 of the program. And um, Kim, Professor Kim Gyeong Dong is a professor emeritus of Seoul National University and member of the National Academy of Sciences, Korea. Uh, he previously taught at North Carolina State University at Raleigh, Ecole de uh, O, I don't know, French, very prestigious, prestigious institution in Paris, okay, and vice versa. Uh, actually, uh, he taught at SNU at the, at the Department of Sociology, and he is the main pillar uh, who built uh, this uh, uh, sociology department at this university. And let me introduce the uh, Professor Kim Gyeong Dong for his keynote speech. <laughs> Professor Kim will make a presentation, I would say, for 40 minutes after that. If we want, we can have a Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I'd like to congratulate Seoul National University Asia Center, especially uh, Professor Im Hyun Jin and uh, the Director Kang Myung Gu for uh, on this uh, occasion of uh, the anniversary of founding this center. This is rather, you know, young center, but it is already uh, holding you know, this uh, very grandiose international conference on very grandiose subject matter. Um, and of course, it gives me great pleasure to be able to speak uh, on this occasion uh, as a keynoter. As you see, I have written a rather lengthy paper for this. Uh, of course, I'm not going to read, read the whole thing. I, I will try my best to, to put, you know, squeeze in a rather synoptic kind of uh, presentation, just oral presentation here. And uh, I'm kind of uh, addicted to recently to uh, this notion of alternative discourses. Uh, in social science especially. So I have actually completed a manuscript for a book entitled Alternative Discourses on Modernization and Development, East Asian Perspective. It, it's a you know, long book to be published. I don't know who is going to publish this. <laughs> uh, but um, so I said, OK, I'm going to maybe uh, say a few words about how we should approach this question of capitalism in Asia with so much of commonalities as well as diversity. And uh, I thought I should bring in this, you know, little pet theory of alternative theory, sort of, of modernization I have been developing. And um, this, I'll just make a few uh, remarks on this before we, are, before we go into the uh, subject matter of capitalism in East Asia. Uh, I try to sort of build up a theory of modernization from a different perspective, that is, you know, usually the other side of the track. Most of the theories that have been developed uh, are looking at modernization from the Western perspective, mainly, or global perspective too. But uh, but I, I have tried to uh, build up a theory which will tell you the story of modernization from the other side of the track. And uh, this happens to be East Asia. 
And uh, East Asia, of course, uh, has many countries which are uh, late comers in the process of global modernization. So when you look at this whole thing from a late modernizer's point of view, you may have a little bit different ideas about how you're going to explain all these things. Very complicated transformations that have occurred in the process of modernization. Modernization started in Western Europe, maybe around the turn of the 16th century or so, uh, has this tendency of expansionism. So they have created a process of international acculturation. So that's the first keyword. And those countries which uh, met with this international acculturation, the title of international acculturation, then they had to make some kind of selective adaptation. So the selectivity is the second key word. OK, what kind of selectivity? More, well, largely political and cultural. The mechanism of selectivity or, uh, will be in, in either political or cultural spheres. And this creates an adaptive change on the part of these receiving societies uh, to come up with some alternative modernities of their own character. Okay, that's the essence of what I'm going to use for my analysis of the formation and uh, evolution of capitalism in East Asia. Because Asia is, you know, such a big continent, so I decided to look at from a more familiar site, uh, East Asia, th basically three nations, China, Japan, Korea. And I have uh, developed an idea of how we approach modernization in East Asia from the historical point of view. And in this scheme, I needed to separate two waves of modernization in this region. The first one occurred in the 19th century, mainly. And then there was some kind of disruption, discontinuity, until the end of the Second World War, 1945, and on. So the, the first wave of modernization will be that occurred in the 19th century and then uh, into the early 20th century. The second wave uh, happened in the post-World War II era. That's how I divided the historical processes of modernization in this region. But why modernization? Because the emergence and evolution of capitalism in the world happens to be an inherent ingredient of modernization. Otherwise, you know, you can explain this process differently, but I, I thought this would be a a very nice way of uh, looking at the whole process and put together the two different big ideas of modernization on the one hand and capitalist development on the other. And you will see that they are oh, interlinked. interlinked. They, they are not separate kind of processes. Um, and if you look at it from this angle, then it makes uh, you know, much better sense to, to us at least from the viewpoint of the latecomers. And uh, because I have to deal with three countries, it's going to be a yeah, long story, but let's make a long story short uh, as much as possible. Uh, the Europeans sought to open ports and trade, and as well as you know, uh, diplomatic relations with the East Asian nations around maybe the 16th century when they were just modernizing. But they usually 
were met with very strong uh, resistance from all these countries. This was because of, of basically the policy, what is called the policy of closure, isolation. And this comes from, at least in this region, from a very interesting ideological view propounded by China in that China happens to be the central kingdom or middle kingdom where you know they somehow also expanded this to the notion of center of the universe or center of the civilization and all other lands including the peripheral uh, countries of China were considered as less civilized or barbarian uh, in terms of their civilizational uh, achievement. And therefore, uh, when you have contact with these people, these countries, you are going to be perverted. You're going to be polluted. So, you know, they try to keep these people away as much as possible from uh, this part. Okay, that's the idea of closure. But um, <laughs> this closure policy would not stand too long because you had very advanced uh, nations in terms of the, say, scientific technological advancement, military prowess, economic clout, and some cultural uh, refinement, they, come, they came upon you and said, OK, we, we want to trade with you because we need your silk and so on and so forth. Uh, but the initial response was, of course, isolation, very adamant resistance. For instance, in Korea, we had something called uh, uphold the orthodoxy and re repel any you know, uh, heterodox heterodoxy. And uh, uh, there is this uh, recent uh, king's father who was you know, actually uh, controlling or ruling the country uh, in the 19th century, the, the end of the 19th century. He ordered all the government offices around the world, around the country, to build uh, a stone, you know, uh, ingrained with the the, uh, the words that okay, if you accept these guys, you you it means appeasement. Appeasement means treason. So you know, don't don't accept these guys. Uh, repel them as as much as possible. That sort of very uh, staunch. Uh, attitude of resistance did exist in these countries. Nevertheless, they could not stand the challenge of this the very powerful kind of uh, surge of this international acculturation with mean, so much of power in different uh, areas. All right, how did then Qing dynasty respond? Well, they first Actually, there is another very interesting uh, common attitude among these three countries. And that reads like uh, Chinese substance of culture complemented with Western technologies. Uh, this is, you try to keep your own Chinese civilizational substance, but okay, your technology seems to be better, so we will accept it. That's uh, the uh, meaning of this phrase. And then the Japanese claimed Japanese spirit with Western ability. The ability here means technological again. And then Korea, it is Eastern race, Western technology. The same kind of attitude that, okay, we will accept just this part, technology part, okay. Otherwise, we are not going to allow anything uh, infiltrating into our uh, culture. Okay, 
that's fine. But uh, <laughs> this didn't work either. Uh, somehow, they had to succumb to the uh, military threat, first of all. And then they had to sign mostly unequal treaties with these Western imperial uh, superpowers. So here, already, you begin to see what I call tilted acculturation. It's one-sided, uh, asymmetrical kind of acculturation already uh, began to take place. But my analysis of the emergence and development of capitalism in this region focuses on the relationship between the state and the private sector and how, how they work together or, you know, which, which controlled which. Uh, you might have, uh, you know, the, the common notion that maybe in East Asia the state power was so strong that it just uh, did everything. Which notion uh, doesn't seem to be, you know, too much uh, close to the truth. Because, for instance, uh, the case of Qing Dynasty, the state, the court, and the state bureaucracy had almost, you know, very little impact on the, the budding and emergence of of capitalism, capitalist economic system in China earlier on, uh, uh, in the earlier period, the first wave, 19th century. Then uh, this was because of the inaptitude of the state to actually you know, uh, rule the country. There was so much of insurgencies inside and uh, the state apparatus was crumbling down. and. It was the private sector, mostly entrepreneurial merchants, uh, rich farmers and those guys, who developed family-centered businesses in the private sector. And then later on, of course, when you talk about family-centered business, then it, you know, the scale is small. But then later on, they have expanded by building up the network of these families, too. And they call you know, the importance of quanxi, the connection, the relationship of these uh, different families and, uh, closely linked with, uh, uh, within this network. Well, uh, my time is <laughs> quickly passing, so I'll just skip that. Basically, therefore, in the first wave, Chinese capitalist development it was not the state that uh, had the uh, control of the whole development process. It was the private sector, mostly family enterprises. And this became sort of a pattern later on in the Chinese diaspora because they expanded outside, overseas, creating these very strong networks of family enterprises. Um, and there is some um, remnants of this even today in China. And I'll come back to this quickly later. Now, in the case of Jap Japan, this was quite different. To categorize the emergence of capitalism in, in the Japanese modernization is to look at the relationship between the state and the private sector in terms of the structure of the elite of the society. It was not the state apparatus, bureaucracy itself, that controlled everything. It was the elite core, the, you know, the group of people, ex-samurais, who 
revolted against the shogunate Tokugawa uh, regime and uh, restored Meiji, the Meiji Emperor, and succeeding in what is called Meiji Restoration. But in terms of power structure, it was almost a revolution because you know, these guys were not the uh, elite in the center of the power. They were the lower samurai people who were sort of outside the, the, uh, the core of the power. And they decided to revolt and uh, build up a new nation under one leadership. Before, under the Tokugawa regime, as you know, it was dual leadership, dual uh, power structure. The emperor on, the si on one side and the uh, shogun on the other side. And the, the relationship was very ambivalent and, and uh, delicate. But now you just control, uh, uh, put this together and create a, a single center of power of the nation. And here you see the development of the very strong nationalism uh, through the Meiji Restoration process. But nationalism in this case does not mean that the state, the government will do everything. They, okay, sort of made, made this uh, administrative guidance as their uh, catchphrase. We will, you know, provide some guidance and why don't you join us? Of course, even in Japan, the state started uh, building the uh, initial industries because of the lack of fund on the part of the private sector or the, the lack of you know, trust on you know, the new, new kind of enterprises. These guys were a little bit do, uh, uh, afraid of risking in these new businesses. So the state first developed some of these major uh, infrastructures and industries, but then later they, these private guys found that this was very you know, uh, uh, profitable, so they joined up and then these elite core, they worked together. And uh, in the private sector, as the counterpart of this oligarch, they call it, the uh, samurai group, they created what, what is known as Zaibats, the network of big uh, private enterprises. And this is how Japan created their capitalism. Of course, one very distinct uh, advantage that you may find in the Japanese case of modernization was that they were very uh, eager and uh, actually uh, aggressive in terms of uh, studying, learning from the West, S sending so many uh, young students and so on. They themselves, the, uh, you know, the members of the elite, they themselves visited different uh, European and North American countries personally studying and learning what they were doing. And uh, if I had time, I could tell you all kinds of interesting stories, but uh, uh, I cannot do this. Anyhow, and that's how they learned the technology and the uh, know-how for, for the capitalist economy development. In the case of Korea, <laughs> Unfortunately, the state was very weak, and uh, you know all kinds of uh, rebels and revol uh, 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 revolts were occurring all over the country, and they they were unable to meet the challenge from the outside. And of course, you know the ruler King Kojong, uh, who was interested in some Western technologies and and uh, some know-how, but and sent some, some young guys to the United States and uh, Europe. But this was uh, not very aggressive nor uh, widespread because Korea was poor. They, cannot, they could not afford to send so many people 
like, like in Japan or even in China. Uh, so very much unprepared was Korea in terms of uh, adapting and adopting uh, the new uh, cultures from the outside. And uh, somehow, Japan, when she modernized herself in the middle of the 19th century, starting from that, and by the end of the 19th century, the, you know, Japan was you know, the first imperial nation in Asia. And they wanted to colonize different parts of Asia. And they, they struggled. They fought with Russia, defeated them. China defeated them by this kind of uh, triumph in, in the region. China, uh, Japan became uh, the most powerful nation. And uh, somehow, they made the deal with the United States to take over Korea uh, instead of, I mean, uh, in return for the uh, United States taking over the Philippines. You know, this was the secret deal. Um, so Korea became a colony. OK. You talk about colonial modernization. They have, you know, uh, still quite a bit of debate over this. But my, according to my theory of modernization, I say colonial modernization is a form of modernization too. You have to now differentiate the nature of modernization under, col under colonial rule. That's how you, you should do it. You cannot simply say colonial modernization is not modernization because it is colonial. That's not true. It's modernization. And it was basically the Japanese who introduced the capitalist economy here. And they occupied the larger, much, you know, larger part of the economy anyway. Uh, and then in the 40s, 30s and 40s, they were waging wars. So they, they were trying to build up world industries. And the colonies were, of course, nice places to, to do that. That much of industrialization occurred in Korea by the Japanese. But then some uh, wealthy farmers and merchants, they also began their own, they called it nationalist uh, economy and capitalist. And uh, some of these uh, still are uh, flourishing, like Samsung. And uh, well, there are other uh, cases, but uh, some already started during the colonial period. Um, OK, that's so much for the first wave. Now, we all know about the second wave very much, so I don't want to go into any detailed uh, account of uh, these experiences. But in China, they started with communism. So when you talk about emergence of an evolution of capitalism in China in the post-World War II era, then you have to start with post Deng Xiaoping uh, period, 1970s, late. And uh, his catchphrase was uh, to develop a you know, strong Chinese socialism with Chinese characteristics. Okay, what is Chinese characteristics? He called it socialist market economy. In fact, it's a uh, it's contradiction by definition, but uh, he has, you know, um, interesting statements making, trying to make sense that, you know, this is not contradiction. Whether it's socialist or capitalist, if choice is that, we are socialist, but we are going to make money anyway. Okay, how you make money? Yeah, capitalism, that's, that's the only choice here. But now, uh, I think we are going to hear from uh, Professor Lin and may, maybe others about uh, modern Chinese capitalism. So I'm not going to go into that. But basically, you have state-owned businesses. Then you have private sectors. 
which may be categorized differently, but you have large-scale private enterprises, and then you have town and village, TVEs, uh, town and village enterprises, which are smaller. And most of them are called getty who, it's individual, uh, you know, private owned kind of business. And they work very closely together with, of course, CCP, Chinese uh, Communist Party. The cadres are deeply involved in uh, running these businesses, whether private or uh, state owned. So this is the very complicated kind of structure that you have, and I'm, I'm sure we're going, we're going to learn much from our Chinese friends. Japan again. Now here, I say disruption because China became a socialist country after 1945. Japan was occupied by the United States. SCAP, you know, the Supreme uh, Commander, MacArthur was there. And he started, you know, programs of liberalization but in due time, he had to uh, reverse this trend because of the Cold War system was developing. And they needed you know, strong Japan in order to fend off the communist infiltration in this region. So when they first started, uh, he ordered to dismantle the Zaibats in the economic sector. You know, and then the reform was uh, extensively conducted. But then later he, uh, also the liberal union, you know, labor union movements. But then by 1948, he, he decided to reverse this and said, okay, stop disbanding Zaibats and, you know, control the uh, public labor unions. And then he gave the government the power to sort of make plans and guide guidelines for the development of the economy. But interestingly, in this case, you have to look at the international context in which some wars were occurred. Uh, Wars broke out in Europe, the First World War. Then in uh, Indochina, later in Korea, as well. And in fact, you know, we always say that uh, the Japanese economic development miracle, economic development was possible, at least to some extent, on account of the war in Korea. You can imagine, you know, the United States wanted to ship all these uh, war supplies and weapons, armor, armors and so on. Well, from the United States, it, it takes so much, so much time across the Pacific, so they decided to have Japan produce these things for the war purposes. Well, not only that, but, you know, the, when you have a war, there are all kinds of subsidiary economic uh, advantages for uh, some countries, at least, involved. Okay, that's how they, they managed to develop the economy. The government was there, but they were not the, you know, totalitarian kind of uh, uh, government guiding everything, controlling everything, no. They worked together with, again, another, this time it's not called Zaibats, it's k Dairen, another network of large enterprises Again, the notion of elite core, the group of elite in Japan, still work. This works as, as the leading uh, decision-making uh, collectivity in Japan. Okay. Uh, in the case of Korea, of course, as you know, uh, we had division of the nation, we had the war, and uh, 1950s, we were simply, you know, 
subsiding, surviving on 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 armors. I mean, arms from uh, from other countries. We call it arms, assistance, of course, mainly from the United States. But anyhow, uh, we had to overcome this poverty, and uh, it was uh, this military uh, junta led by Park Jung Hee that. Uh, initiated the economic development plans. But you see, uh, I, I can remind you that it was already in the 1950s, late 50s, under President Syngman Rhee, they already started drawing up plans. But it was uh, not materialized because of the uh, toppling of the president. And then this was 1960. 61, uh, 60, 61, in this one year period, the democratic regime also drew up their own plan for economic development. But then they were, you know, uh, foiled by this coup. And it was on the basis of these earlier plans that this junta was able to draw up a new plan and then uh, continue uh, successfully uh, to implement these plans to achieve what we have today. Now, I, I would just like to call this uh, to your attention and finish up. Uh, I usually characterize this as a mixed economy. Mixed in the sense, first, they had this catchphrase phrase of guided capitalism. This, okay. We are going to have a market economy, capitalist, uh, in the capitalist sense, but government will provide guidelines. So you, you just follow us, and we'll also support you in different ways, all right? Including capital accumulation, I mean, capital uh, formation, uh, uh, industrial site selection, uh, price, and you know, import, export controls, all kinds of things. Government made these guidelines. And then they recruited the largely, larger scale enterprises to lead the way for industrialization for export. So it's called export-led industrialization program. It is mixed also because not only the public and private sectors worked together closely, it was mixed in the sense that these large corporations were the leaders. Nevertheless, th there were so many small and medium industries which worked very hard together with, in collaboration with the larger corporations as either subsidiaries or other, other kinds of suppliers. So, this is another kind of mix, mixed economy. Um, and you cannot uh, lightly dismiss the role of the entrepreneurial private sector. <laughs> and uh, just a final comment is that somehow uh, in China, with this type of, you know, very interesting mixture of the party control, state control, and the private uh, initiatives, there are room for depravity. You know, you will, you will see all kinds of corruption, practices of corruption, which actually are uh, making the top leaders in the Chinese Communist Party uh, a big, big headache. In Japan, somehow, uh, early on already in the first wave of modernization and capitalist development, they separated ownership and management rather very cleverly. And uh, here you see, that e even though you had government and, and the business working together, the collusion was not as, you know, intense as either in China or Korea. Probably you'll see a lot of this uh, 
question of depravity in the case of Korean development. Because of this, uh, in this case, government is you know, on the upper hand position. And then in order to gain some kind of favor, the business has to offer some kind of kickbacks. And this has become a very serious uh, problem for our social, moral uh, kind of culture in this society. I'm sorry I had to uh, spend more time than allowed to me, but uh, <laughs> with this long paper, I couldn't just, you know, uh, do any better job than what I have done now here. Thank you very much. <laughs>